Hello everyone, welcome to the first episode of SideQuest, a new segment we are kicking off here at Polycosm. In our SideQuest videos, we'll be exploring quick techniques and ideas that don't quite fit into any other video series we have going on. In our first episode, we'll be trying out a little experiment on combining a 2D character and a 3D environment with some digital painting projected on top. Our aim is to be able to bring a hand-drawn 2D style and high-quality 3D assets together while retaining the illusion of a 3D space. Well, let's find out whether we succeed or spectacularly fail. Let's get our character illustration done first. I have a fairly rough idea on how this character is going to look like in my head, especially when it comes to his demeanor and pose. So we won't be doing lots of concept sketches this time, we are going to try to move a little bit quicker. However, I will spend a decent amount of time trying to nail the gesture down and block in the main volumes for his anatomy. I'm paying a lot of attention here to his ribcage and his hips. His upper body is tilting one way fairly significantly, therefore his hips will have to tilt the opposite way to balance. Poses like these are termed contrapposto. Once I'm happy with the pose, well, I'm never happy, but let's say satisfied with the pose, I'll be roughly sketching out his outfit. Even though I'm designing this without any thumbnail sketches or anything like that, I'm still paying attention to the shape hierarchy and shape language in general throughout the design. I'm also staying zoomed out to make sure I'm working on the whole image before I get tempted by getting into any fine details. I can roughly indicate things like the stitching on his jacket and you know other details like that, but it's best not to get too lost in them. I'm sketching in blue and red colors right now just to be able to see the different elements clearly. This is a trick used by traditional comic and animation artists who would sketch in colored pencils first and then do their final line art on top. Even though with Photoshop you can just you know adjust the layer opacity and get rid of your sketch layer with ease, I, I still like this method of working. I'm going to sketch in the features on his face right now and refine some of the detailing on his outfit. I'm putting in darker lines as I start to commit to my decisions more. Okay, this is pretty much done now as a sketch and I'm feeling ready to move on to the final line art. Alright, let's knock back the opacity and start going over the sketch for our final line art. I'm using my line thickness to imply depth and varying the line quality depending on the material that I'm drawing. For example, cloth will more likely to have softer lines than something made of metal. Best way to improve your line quality and your understanding of how to best represent different materials with line art is to study from observation as much as you can. Draw what you see around you, sketch from photographs and study the structure of organic and inorganic forms. Deliberate and regular practice is what's going to improve your skills. Once the line art is done for this stage, I create a selection and fill that with a flat color below my line art and use this as a base for my coloring. I wanted him to have a warm color palette overall, with some cools to complement that. So I started with blocking in a nice blue color for his cape cloak thing. Then I move on to blocking in the rest. After I blocked in the base colors, I decided to darken them and paint in some light over it, with a solid color layer set to soft light. I usually paint in the shadows, but... You know, I wanted to shake things up a bit this time around. Sometimes you just gotta live a little. I'm not sure about the kind of environment he's going to be in just yet, so I'm blocking in a basic light direction for now and leaving the reflective light and fill light to figure out later on. For now, I just need enough light and color information so Christina can work with it. Once the environment is mostly blocked in, I'll paint over this to help him blend into the scenery better. 
Alright, I think this is pretty much done for now. I'm going to send this over to Christina so she can take over and I can go make myself a cup of coffee and eat some cookies or something. So, while Omerjan is selfishly enjoying cookies, it's my turn to take over. So yeah, like Omerjan mentioned at the beginning of this video, my contribution to this mini project will involve creating a rough blockout in Blender using primitives, animating a rough camera animation where we will make the camera follow an empty, and then start importing in high quality scans from Quixel using their one-click bridge software. Once I put together everything, Omerjan will paint over the models to give everything a more painterly feel. And I will finally reproject the painted version back onto the models in Blender for final presentation. So starting off, if you're unfamiliar with Quixel, it's a subscription-based website that offers amazing high-quality 3D scan assets, decals, textures, and so on. You basically get a set amount of points per month to spend on assets. Once they're purchased, you can import them into Blender using a nifty bridge software called Quixel Bridge. You just choose your export options from the bridge, hit export, and it will automatically show up in your Blender scene, textures included. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> I'll go into more detail on this in my next Nidbrick video coming out in a couple of weeks, so stay tuned for that. A Quixel membership costs about $19 a month, excluding taxes, and is honestly, in my opinion, well worth it. Okay, before I jump into Blender, I need to make sure our character has a transparent background. In Photoshop, I'm gonna deselect everything but the character and export it as a transparent PNG. In Blender, hook off the Import Images as Planes add-on in Preferences and go to Import, Images as Planes, and let's choose our character. In order to make our character look less washed out, let's turn down the specular completely. Right, let's start blocking out our rough scene. I'm gonna speed through this process as it's literally just pressing Shift A and adding in primitives. Omerjan drew up a super basic sketch to give me a rough idea of what he was thinking, so I kind of used that as a simple guide, but instead of going for a forest vibe, I decided to actually do more of a tropical scene since the character sort of gave me pirate vibes. But yeah, as you just saw, I used the ocean modifier to get in some natural waves in the background, and also used the A and T landscape add-on, which ships with every version of Blender. So if you're interested in that, you just need to activate that under preferences. For the far off background, I found a tropical ocean view photograph, which I thought would work really well for our scene. No need to get detailed with the 3D block out just yet. We're going to be switching out all of these with mega scan assets later on anyway. I used the add-on physical starlight and atmosphere to set up some really quick and easy, but also more realistic lighting. Link to that will be in the description below. I tried to match the lighting direction with the sketch, which was really easy thanks to the brilliant UI of this add-on. When the block count was done, I started working on the camera animation. The setup was really easy, just a camera with a track 2 object constraint and an empty. So what happens now if you go into camera view and move the camera around in the scene, it will always be facing the empty. So I can freely move the camera around in the scene without worrying if our character is centered at all times. Keyframing the camera animation was also just really simple. If you want just point A to point B type animation, you just keyframe the starting position by pressing I and choosing location and rotation, jump forward in the timeline, change our camera position and press I and location and rotation again. Very basic stuff. I ended up changing the camera animation later on because Omerjan and I both felt it was moving a bit too much. Right, now that the camera animation is done and the block out is done, let's start bringing in our assets. Basically with the bridge all you need to do is go to the export settings, choose 2K since we'll be painting over the assets we don't really need crazy high details, and choose Blender. 
If this is your first time importing, you'll get a little install add-on option under the blender button and the bridge kind of takes care of the rest. For me, it didn't really work and I still got the error message. So I manually installed the add-on by downloading it via the website and went to preferences, add-ons and install. Choose the zip folder and done. Then go to file, import and press mega scans, import alembic files. If the export still doesn't work, try closing and opening up Blender again. So that's basically what I did for all of the models. It was stupid easy and the assets are amazingly high quality. If you've downloaded a texture, it will be in the texture drop down menu. So if you create a plane, add a texture and scroll through the different textures already present in the scene, it should be there. I'm going to speed through replacing all of the old assets because it's pretty straightforward. Some of the assets, like the palm trees, I had to expand by enabling proportional editing. You can do that by hitting O. While placing the assets, I made sure that throughout the entire animation we see the assets fully and that they weren't being cut off. I repeatedly played the animation and moved things around so they would look compositionally pleasing at the start, but also at the end of the animation. Alright, now that our scene is ready, I'll save out the PNG renders by choosing RGBA and PNG in the render settings. Under render properties, I also hooked on the transparent option under film. That's to get the transparent background in the render. I decided to expand the resolution so that there's more canvas for Omerjohn to paint over. This is just to make sure that when the camera animation plays, the parts out of view at the beginning of the animation doesn't show. Because Omerjohn won't be painting on these parts, we might get some very ugly artifacts if the camera turns a bit too much. Then I'll decide which assets to group, like the midground rock and the tree for example, or the log and branch, and hit render. Once I've saved out the PNGs for all of the assets, I compiled a PSD for Omerjan. Here's that Photoshop file, and I'll just flick through the layers so you can kind of understand what I decided to group and what I decided to kind of leave individually. Alright, that's pretty much my part done, at least for now. I am passing the torch over to Omerjan. See you guys in a bit. Okay, this is... this is looking not too shabby so far. But, obviously, a lot more work has to be done to blend the different elements together. Right now, the 3D assets are looking... well, way too 3D. So to start with, I'll be knocking back the details on these different layers with a surface blur filter. I'll be blurring the background quite a bit, and as I progress towards the foreground, I will turn down the intensity of the filter a little bit. I'm also painting some atmospheric effects to push the background elements further back. Another thing to watch out for when you are painting over 3D renders are edges. All the edges in this image are super crisp and clean. I'm gonna have to paint over most of them to soften them in part and even possibly create some lost edges for a more appealing image. For the method we are working with, you will need to hand paint the cast shadows because Christina will have to remove the lighting information later on. She provided me with a render to use as reference to get the shadows accurately so you'll see me referring back to that regularly. I'm painting a lot of fill light into the shadows to create a more believable lighting scenario, but also for a more stylized scene. The blue fill light in the shadows probably won't be that strong in reality, but I find it useful to exaggerate that effect a little bit. I think it makes the overall scene more vibrant and appealing than having shadows that are just more black and darker which probably won't be the case in reality anyway. At this point, I wanted to add an outline on the midground and foreground elements as well, but instead of drawing this, I'm going to add a stroke layer effect. One thing you have to watch out for, and I did make this mistake here at first, 
is you have to have the stroke on the inside rather than outside. If you put the stroke on the outside, then once that layer is projected in Blender, it will be cropped out. The outline you have created will be cropped out. So learn from my mistakes and make sure to pick the inside option. When we ran a little test for this, we had some issues with the ground layer due to the camera movement. So Christina asked me to paint on the texture for the ground plane directly. As you can see, that's what I'm doing here. I need to try and match the color and the light this asset needs to have in the final scene as closely as possible. Now it's time to go back to the character and paint on him some more to make sure he can blend in with the scene better. This is going to require adding more details, texture and some more light information, like the warm light that will bounce from the sand and reflect on his boots and the cool light from the sky that is going to fill in the shadows. And now back to work on the environment to add more line art on the 3D assets. So far, they only had an outline and no line information on the inside, which made them stand out a bit. So I'm drawing some extra lines in to indicate overlaps and texture. Adding details like this always feels like therapy to me. It's just so relaxing. From this point on, it's a lot of jumping back and forth between the environment and the character to balance things out. I'm making sure the line art on the character is bold enough to make him belong in the environment, but also stand out a bit as the focal point. I also need to make sure he is detailed enough and doesn't look too plain compared to the rocks and palm trees around him. Okay, it's time for some finishing touches. I'm adding a stroke effect on the character and a layer of noise for some extra texture. Then I drop him back in the scene and here we go. I think this looks good and we are ready to move on to the next stage. Back to you, Christina. Now that Omar John has painted over all the different renders I saved out previously, it's time to start adding them back into the scene. Since we're working with a projection method for all but the ground plane, we need to choose our individual assets, assign a new material, drop in the appropriate painted over layer, as in the image file, turn down the specular, head into edit mode and hit assign. The texture is going to look super weird at first, but all we need to do is just hit U for unwrap and choose project from view. Make sure that you're projecting from the view you initially rendered in, so that means being in camera mode and on frame zero. The assets are going to look super weird and yellow, uh, that's because our scene light is still on, so it's sort of kind of doubling up on the lighting, if that makes sense. We'll get rid of the lighting in just a bit. I'm going to speed through repeating this process for the rest of the assets until I get to the ground, where we're going to do things a little bit differently. Alright, now that it was time to fix the ground, instead of projecting the ground, I asked Omerjan to actually paint over the original texture map and just make it look a bit more painterly. Since the camera moves a fair bit, I thought it would be best to do it this way. I just basically replaced the old texture with the new texture for the base color input. Nothing fancy. Now that all of the textures were projected, I decided to get rid of all the lighting in the scene. As soon as you do that, it'll get really dark. To fix that, you need to go to the world panel settings on the right and just brighten the surface color. Just turn it up like all the way to white. For some reason, when I got rid of the lighting, the ground texture got disconnected, so I had to kind of reconnect some nodes. I also had to reproject some of the asset textures again. I think this is all because when you use physical starlight and atmosphere, it sort of overrides your texture information so when you get rid of it, things might get a bit messed up. The next step was to get our character in and add in all of the cast shadows, which were all painted on individual layers. Since they're just a flat 2D plane, it can be a bit tricky to kind of place them correctly in the scene, so always kind of twist your camera around to make sure that things are properly aligned. 
As a final step, I decided to add in all of the 2D painted plans and get rid of the old ones. Because the old ones had alpha maps, we couldn't manage to like paint an outline on the plans, so we just decided that the 2D plans would do. And honestly, that is pretty much it. Just make sure to choose your export format, hit Ctrl F12 and start rendering your animation. Not too difficult, huh? Let's jump to the final presentation and wrap up this first episode of SideQuest. Bye! Wow, this, this turned out quite cool. I'm glad we went ahead with this little experiment. I think it made us realize the potential this workflow has. And that's us finished with our first side quest. We have more side quests planned for the near future, so if you enjoyed this, make sure to subscribe for more. Thanks for your time, and see you next week. Take care everyone.